The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, signing on uh, and attending this webinar for us. Um, I'm just going to do, my name is David Rall uh, from Byte Security Partnerships, for those of you that don't know me. I'm just going to do a, a very short introduction, um, and then I'm going to hand over to David O5, one of their field systems engineers, who's going to go through uh, the rest of the webinar and go through the presentation in detail. At the end of that, we'll then take any questions any of you had and um, go from there. So just a, a very quick Oh, he says, as his screen goes very weird. Uh, just a very, very quick introduction uh, to us here at Byte Security Partnerships. Uh, so we were purchased by the Bytes Group in August 2011. Uh, been in business since uh, since 1999. Um, really, for us, we we were uh, an independent, small independent reseller before we were purchased, um, and we still are, to a large degree, an independent reseller. We're not so small now, um, but we are still an independent reseller. The, the Bytes Group pretty much leaves us alone uh, beyond a, a monthly update meeting, which I guess you'd expect. And we are still uh, as agile and, and as responsive as we ever were. Um, so yeah, very, very proud and very passionate about what we do. We, we do believe in, in doing a great job for our customers. Uh, you know, not everything's perfect all the time, and I don't think anybody would expect me to say that it was. Um, you know, one of the key differences about us as a reseller is that we do genuinely care about what we do, which means we care about putting things right, and, and as most people will tell you, it's not about what you do when everything's going well, it's about how you deal with problems um, when things go wrong that, that make you out and mark you out as being different. Um, Byte Security Partnerships and Byte Software Services form Bytes in the UK. As you can see, we're between 150 and 200 million this year as a business. Byte Technology Group worldwide is 700 million, um, which is part of the Ultron Group, which is 2.3 billion, technically the Altec Group now, uh, due to a share buyback in South Africa. So yeah, big, big business um, um, with a very, very solid foundation. Um, this webinar, as you hear the title, Driving Down Application Delivery Cost via Automation, excuse me, Automization isn't the word, Automation and Customization. Um, you know, application delivery is a very hot topic, you know, web-based, virtual, private, cloud, etc., etc. But the delivering applications to end users and doing it in the most cost-effective way is a very, very hot topic at the moment. Um, we've been partnering for F with F5 for the last sort of two to three years now, and, and this really is part of F5's bread and butter in terms of the way they do this and, and how this works. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to David Warburton, who is um, one of the field system engineers for F5. David, hopefully you're there. I am. Excellent. Thanks, so I'll pass this over to you. Um, and um, David will go through what F5 can do to help you, our end users, with some of these challenges. Right, thanks, yep. David. So I just see to, that to and I can see everyone yep. my screen. Yeah, it's all there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to mute right. out. If you need me for anything, give me a shout. Great, thank you. All right, well, uh, again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I will, I will kind of skip the instructions uh, too much. Really, just to kind of say that from my point of view, um, I'm one of a fairly large team of about 30, 35 systems engineers in the UK for F5. Um, and specifically, one of the areas that I focus on is application services and automation. Um, so from my point of view, I'm being a lot, uh, spending a lot of time helping partners and helping customers um, create or improve upon automation tasks, probability, um, templating of applications, and really just helping make them make the most of their, their application services, really. Um, and as David said, what we're going to be looking at today is, is how we can make use of that um, really to, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, one of the things is going to be how you can drive higher ROIs out of your applications, how you can respond and act uh, in a more agile manner to changing requirements. Um, so whether you are just starting off from a programming perspective, whether you have a number of automation tools already and you're keen to see what we as F5 see as the kind of core uh, requirements um, and, and best practice from an uh, automation and orchestration point of view, uh, then hopefully we'll, we'll go through some of those details and um, that will become obvious to you as we go through. So application worlds are traditionally fairly complex environments, whether you're looking at um, a specific part of the entire stack, 
right from storage in the back end through to hardware and compute. You may have various network or service-based appliances and all the different services that you layer on top. So you're already looking at tens, if not dozens or hundreds of different vendors and technologies in there. But then when you start looking at the applications being deployed across multiple sites, uh, maybe expanding into cloud, whether it be public, private, or hybrid cloud environments, suddenly you've got an awful lot of different touch points that you need to, to, to go back to to change or to deploy for new or existing applications. So key to helping this is programmability. Um, and we're going to go through some of these points now, so I won't, I won't linger on them. Um, but everything to allowing the business to be uh, more agile, uh, ensuring that IT actually aligns with the business drivers and the business requirements, um, supporting the network engineers. Uh, we're looking at a very interesting time at the moment in terms of network architectures changing the expansion of SDN and, and DevOps and different methodologies and uh, network architectures. Applications are constantly having more and more requirements put on them to both be more secure, uh, be more scalable and so on. The operations team um, have more demands put on them as a result of all of this. Um, they are having to look at a much bigger stack of technology, different services, and they need to keep their finger on all these different requirements and services and making sure they're all healthy and knowing what they need to do in terms of either modifying existing applications or deploying new ones. And you know, I'm glad to say that security isn't any longer really an afterthought uh, for a lot of people. Security has been designed in from the get-go. Um, DevOps is something that kind of fits in quite nicely from, from our point of view in terms of this webinar, thinking about programmability, but a lot of people in the community now like the term uh, DevOpsSec. So it's not just about having a, an agile uh, methodology in terms of application deployments. Security really forms a, a key part of, of, that, uh, of that pyramid, if you like, of, of three things. So how, how do you respond to changes at the moment? You know, what things do, does your application, does your business, do your IT team need to do to change to things like increasing user bases? Um, we've heard people, customers uh, come up with a quite bizarre term saying they've been uh, too successful from a marketing campaign. You know, they've, they've driven marketing and it's worked so well that actually the back-end applications are really struggling, if not fallen over, because of the huge demand from, from increased customer user base. How do you scale your applications? You know, do you have an easy and automated way of scaling something out? Um, you may have methods of you know, deploying applications into new uh, virtual machines or hardware, but how do you scale the actual application, the interface that the users talk to, how do you scale that across those new devices? New services that you might want to deploy uh, or changing services. So you may have existing applications, you may have existing load balancing technologies. How do you start easily layering on um, things like application firewalling or caching or SSL offload without uh, having another standalone service to manage? Throw in some security incidents, which is, you know, just seem to be on a constant increase and not going away. And all the while you're expected to maintain, if not improve, application performance uh, and responsiveness for, for users. So traditional programming and automation has gone some way to help with this. Um, operation teams can, at the moment, already, you know, they, they can create uh, discrete or individual scripts or little applications or little orchestration flows that will go and deploy or repeat uh, new application services or make small configuration changes. The, the drawback to this at the moment is that these are all completely discrete scripts or, or applications. Um, they tend to use a range of different protocols. They will tend to use a range of different programming languages. And the other problem to this is that the network state, as we call it, tends to be hidden away underneath all of these appliances or services down underneath the actual appliances themselves. And what we mean by this in real terms is you end up with a lot of different configuration files and appliances and network devices, and you don't get the big picture view of an end-to-end -end application deployment. So if we look at the, the alternative way of doing this using APIs, and we'll talk more about, about APIs in a second, um, but really APIs is, is allowing machine-to-machine -machine communication. So it's allowing 
one vendor to talk to another vendor. It's allowing one uh, one application to easily understand what another one's doing without having to know the bits and bytes and, and how the actual application works. So what this means in real terms is that operations teams can now have a single place to go and manage all of their automation scripts. And that single point of control actually has an understanding and awareness of everything underneath it. And it can then have a, a consolidated uh, orchestration or workflow to configure a number of different services at the same time. The benefit to this is that it also raises the network state to a much higher, much more visible layer where the operations team or, or application or business owners can actually just get that end-to-end -end configuration for an application or a service and actually start reporting on the performance and health of an application, not of a network device or an IP address. Again, we've mentioned APIs. You know, one thing that's, that's really happened over the past couple of years is a huge explosion in APIs. Um, and this is really obviously such a big trend and why things like SDN, DevOps, um, uh, and new ways of working are really being made possible because of this huge increase in APIs. Again, if we were writing very manual scripts with different languages and different interfaces and so on, things were very, very difficult and prone to getting broken when a vendor may have their, uh, the way they work, for example. Uh, and one of the big things that's helped with this explosion in APIs is the adoption of REST-based APIs, which makes it far more uniform, far more standard for people to actually go and base their APIs on. So I think this quote really speaks for itself. Um, and it's no accident that, that we've got a quote from Puppet Labs. From an FI's point of view, we have a really strong integration with Puppet. Um, but you know, look, you look at that quote from, from organizations deploying code 30 times faster and 8,000 times faster than their peers, uh, which is pretty incredible. And again, we're going to go into business benefits. That one pretty much speaks for itself. You know, if, you're, if, if the IT team, the operations team can allow the business to become far more agile and respond far quicker than its competitors, you have an immediate competitive advantage. But where do you start investing to actually make use or see these benefits? Uh, and again, we're going to go through one of these uh, points here, so I won't linger on this. We're going to start with working with vendors. We're not. We're going to start with programming skills. So the one thing that I've, I've found in my experience, and I come from a, I found I suppose I'm in the sense that in my time for IT, I've started in support, it's gone through IT service management to design and architecture, uh, and also working on uh, designing and deploying um, fairly large public cloud uh, infrastructures. And a number of organizations I've seen have had varying degrees in terms of support for programming skills. You know, some various teams have had existing programming skills within them, many don't. Um, you tend to be almost lucky if you have a few guys in the team that, that have some skills or some experience from elsewhere. So one of the things that's key to do uh, to help with this is to start using languages that vendors support. Um, or probably more than that, I would add, if, if, you're, if it's something you're starting out new, if you're investing in skills for, for new developers or for, to, to, to get development skills for existing staff, choose some of the more popular languages, the things such as Python or, or PowerShell, for example, um, there are many, many languages out there, um, and one of the key things to APIs is that it doesn't generally matter what programming languages you use. I mean, that's, that's the real benefit, how flexible they are. But ultimately, one of the things you want is support from the larger community, the public out there, and that's going to be much easier if you choose a language that's, uh, that's very common. So a great painter once said, good artists copy, great artists fill. Uh, and yeah, again, from personal experience, completely attest to that. You know, most of uh, what a lot of my work from a scripting, a programming point of view, it all starts with seeing what other people have done. Um, you know, the term, there's no point reinventing the wheel, is never more appropriate than with programming. Um, programming, you can literally copy and paste code, you can change a few variables, a few commands, and you can be up and running with a fairly complex uh, scripts or, or requirements very, very quickly. The key thing to the stealing piece is that you shouldn't really just copy and paste, you also need to try and understand it. But taking someone else's code, taking what would be public examples or, or uh, existing code off on the internet, for example, is a great place to start and makes it very quick actually to get uh, staff up to speed. 
the other key part of this really is actually from a business point of view, investing uh, in, in staff to allow them to develop their programming skills. Um, again, it's one of those things that there are many companies that at least to date or traditionally haven't necessarily seen that, that immediate uh, return on investment when it comes to allowing staff to develop their, their scripting, their programming skills. But again, we're seeing it everywhere. It's not something that's just reserved to the IT service management team or the guys deploying some, some Windows servers. SDM is all about scripting and, and centralizing configuration and automation and programming. You know, it doesn't mean that network administration is going to become redundant. It means that they're going to have far more time to actually go and work on the bigger picture, work on design. One of the key things as well is to start small and to move bigger. Um, so a personal anecdote is, is some work I did on a reporting script um, for a, a very large and popular backup application. So I started off, uh, just created some simple reports which, which just output um, the, the general health and the status of the backups. And then was given the time by my employer at the time, uh, I spent about a week, week and a half developing a, a very lengthy script to do the full reporting of this backup application. Now, it took me a week, week and a half, almost constantly, to develop this application. But at the end of it, it was saving about one to two man hours every single day. So the return was pretty quickly realized. So leveraging vendors' APIs is key. Um, the one thing that took me so long to develop this, this script for this backup application is that there weren't any APIs available for it. There were lots and lots and lots of different command line tools which output um, data in lots of different formats. So a lot of the script was taking this really raw, really unformatted data and trying to make sense out of it. The key to APIs is that you can make a very simple call and get an expected and standardized response back from it. So actually it makes the scripting and orchestration much, much easier. Also picking uh, a vendor, hopefully, you know, your chosen vendors will hopefully have a large community out there to support you. As I said before, you really don't want to be starting from scratch. Um, we'll talk about the FI specific example a bit later on, but any vendor you work with should hopefully have a very large user base of, of of existing scripts, codes, examples, and templates that you can use, but also the wider community that you can just go to and ask for help if you come into problems. Picking the programming language or protocol that works best for your environment um, is kind of a given. Again, I would probably expand that by saying that choosing a vendor or ensuring that your vendor has as wide a support as possible. Um, we've kind of mixing protocols and languages there with REST open Perl and so on. Um, the idea being you should really get a choice. You should be able to develop in the language that you or your staff or your, your team are comfortable in. The APIs should be able to just get dropped in no matter what the programming language or, or chosen protocol is that you want to use. So building internal frameworks. Um, so what do we mean by framework? Well, the much bigger picture would mean uh, things such as principles, design processes, uh, the way in which your team would start going about creating the code, um, the method in which it would get deployed. But I suppose specifically in our example, we're looking at reusable code. So again, the things to be checking out for with your chosen vendors would be the fact that they have support for reusable code. Can you create what we call procedures or functions, uh, things that you can reuse? So you can invest in the time up front. It may take you a little longer to create the code initially, but it should be easily reusable. Uh, whether that's in the same platform, across different platforms, swapping out a few different variable names and parameters should allow you to instantly reuse that code and not have to reinvent the world every time you want to do the same thing, but on a different platform. Encouraging collaboration is a, is a good, um, is really just a key thing as well. Um, again, all too often developers can, can work very siloed on their own. So encouraging code sharing, encouraging maybe code review, whether informally or formally, before code is released is, is really key. And look out for things, you know, look out for the tools to make these jobs easier. Um, code sharing, um, really, you want to be on the lookout for um, 
code repositories, places you can go and version control your code. So that if changes do get made and you need to roll back or if you need to have work, people working on different versions of code, this is, this is something that could be automated for you. Now you could start off simply, you could have, for example, a wiki or a SharePoint site, for example, to store your code. But again, there are things like GitHub out there, very popular, common and free tools to make to automate and do all this for you. Iterate and source perfection. I think this one really is key. Um, you know, we're not all going to go and create an awesome, you dancing, billing, reporting, uh, and automation and provisioning engine for a new cloud platform on our very first attempt. You know, especially if we're working with a new team, if we're investing skills in new developers, it's starting small. Um, and, you know, things aren't going to go right the first time. One of the other myths, however, is that. You know, developers um, and people, I suppose, abstracted from, from the business there, the, 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 um, the people defining the, the business objectives and, and deciding what they really, how they want to take the business forward and how they want their application to interact with consumers, is that the, the developers or the ITSM team may be abstracted from that. They may not see the business objectives. And so when they're writing the code, they may not know the actual objectives that are intended. They may, have give, they may be given a desired output result that wants that uh, that needs to happen, but may not necessarily have the understanding as to why that needs to happen. Uh, and the other myth is you actually need quote unquote programmers. And certainly, if you have you know huge requirements, if you're deploying a full application, then needs to say you're going to go on, want to go out and and, and hire a, a full team of programmers. But again, as I alluded to before, really what we're looking at is skilling up everybody with some programming skills. I mean, there's been countless you know, news articles and, 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 and work being done by the government and various teams from Google and so on to encourage development or developers within schools. And actually, you know, my own kids are, are using various kind of interactive applications online to develop their, their coding, their programming skills. Um, but really, this should be applicable to anybody that works in, in an IT kind of role. Everybody should be able to look at code to get a general understanding of the kind of things that are happening. And then once you understand general programming logic, it's not that too, it's not too difficult to, to go from application or sort of from, from one language to another one, get a good understanding of what's happening and make some changes if you need to. So these kind of uh, skills need to be given to everybody really. Um, going back to the business objectives, you know, code really does, the, the reason about this code, yes, it's to save time, uh, to increase ROI and so on and so on. But there needs to be a constant awareness of, of the business driver in mind. You know, if you lose sight of that, then you can create the, a masterpiece of code, a masterpiece of artwork, if you like, that is, is incredibly efficient, uh, is very, very long, but doesn't actually do what the business objective is set out. So there are some of the places to start looking at, but in terms of actual technology, in terms of the, the data center and, and, and architectures, what's the first place to start? Um, or where's the first place to start, sorry? You can, of course, look at um, the automatic provision of virtual machines, maybe, um, the configuration of, of storage area networks, um, or other bits and pieces. The, what we see as a genuine um, best place to start in terms of getting increased ROI, or the much quicker uh, investment and in a much quicker return on investing in these skills is with a network. Um, and we'll go on and we'll look at why in just a second. Um, but when we look at the why that is, um, again, data center deployments, changing network architectures are one of the most um, rapidly changing environments in the data center at the moment. So whether you are looking at deploying SDN, whether you're looking at going to, to multiple data centers or cloud environments, uh, they are constantly changing. But network programmability, you know, is, is a great thing to say, but uh, it needs to be easy. And the reason that it should be easy is that a lot of the, the application delivery controller should be doing a lot of this heavy lifting for you. So load balancers, application delivery controllers, you know, they need to give you the scalability and, and availability. You know, they're one of the core requirements. Application fluency and network fluency should, is, is obviously core. But the third, the third leg to this, um, or the third part of this requirement really is programmability. Um, it's, it's when you start looking at programmability of the ABC, that's when you start realizing the benefits of, of the ABC as a whole. 
So let's look at some of the problems in terms of provisioning application services, and that's both deploying the, the ADC devices themselves, but also looking at deploying applications themselves. So as new applications are coming online and changing, we need to make changes to them, but also the changing of the structure means we need to deploy new ADCs possibly. We need to do this consistently. You know, we, we can't have, and traditionally we still see this now, ADCs are being deployed even by the same team with inconsistencies. DNS testing might be different. Um, low, balancing, um, low balancing algorithms might be selected differently. Now, these might have valid reasons for the application, but a lot of the time they are just human errors or, or little mistakes that get made that result in inconsistencies across the way ADCs are deployed. Uh, so we need to do this consistently, we need to do it quickly, and we need to do it accurately. If we look at, again at a, a fairly typical uh, application set as architecture, we would have a, a fabric of, of applications or controllers, but there are still many more elements in that that we need to be able to configure, whether it's the application proxy, whether it's uh, interfacing with different networking protocols or, or overlay networks, or interfacing with different teams as well. So the challenges um, that we see at the moment is, again, the migration to cloud, is we're seeing a, a challenge from a licensing point of view. So whether this be uh, a sharing of physical ADC hardware in, in a public or a, um, a, a private or, or sorry, con, uh, hybrid cloud environments, whether it's looking at deploying individual virtual instances of this ADC, there are still licensing challenges here. Again, we've mentioned inconsistencies. And we also need to make sure that when these ADCs are configured, we have the relevant skills to actually do that. So the solutions to some of these problems, again, it won't come as any surprise, is the automation and programmability that we can, we can use to solve this. So we have technologies to, to use the APIs to configure and license the ADCs consistently. We have um, ADC templates, which means that new virtual editions or even new physical instances of an ADC can get automatically provisioned, automatically licensed with minimal skills required from the application or the business owner. Um, all these policies, all these uh, configuration details should be held centrally and which would then allow you, the business owner, to just deploy applications or ADCs without needing to have very low level skills for ADC in particular. So what F5 has as its recommended API, API architecture, again, we saw at the start of, of the slide deck that there's nothing stopping people going out and, and writing individual scripts um, using individual APIs to different appliances and products right now. But obviously, you're still having an awful lot of apl um, replication. You're still possibly using a number of different programming languages. So what we see is you should be able to have a, a pool of services, um, uh, an ADC fabric if you like. So it shouldn't matter whether you're deploying to a chassis based system, a, a typical hardware based appliance or a virtual edition, you should be able to treat that just as a pool of resource that you can use uh, as and when you need to. The key to this is having a centralized management platform, so a single place that you can target with your scripts, with your API calls, that can know not only automatically deploy new ADCs and deploy applications onto them, but can also interface with external systems. So whether that's integrating to software as a service or infrastructure as a service platforms, whether it's deploying um, SaaS applications or integrating with SaaS applications external to your environment, or even possibly interfacing with newer networking technologies like Cisco ACI and VMware NSX. So the key to this is having a central management platform that can configure not only northbound requests to external platforms, but the southbound ones to your own ADC environment on-premise as well. So provisioning applications. Um, again, we've mentioned some of the, the inconsistencies that can creep up around deploying ADCs themselves. That's exacerbated really when you look at deploying applications. Um, you can take two exchange environments which could look exactly the same at the back end, but if there isn't that same consistency in deploying or choosing the same 
SSL offload uh, profiles, the same load balancing algorithms, you can end up with a very different customer facing application. So really the solution is to use application templates. Um, and there's a huge number of benefits for these. Needless to say, one of the key benefits is to end up with, with consistency for all the applications that you deploy. Speed is an obvious one. You should be able to deploy an application much, much quicker using a, an application template than you would do if you were deploying everything from scratch. The other key thing to, to check is that whoever you're working with, whatever, you know, whatever template, you should have the ability to customize or create your own template. It's all very well selecting from a list of, of predefined templates for Exchange or SharePoint, for example, but quite often you'll have your own slightly unique way of deploying SharePoint, or you might have some in-house proprietary application that you'd like to create templates for. So there should always be the ability to either modify or create your own application to root control a template. Some of the benefits, well, an easy button, again, it should be a very simple one-click deploy to this. So rather than having to fill in many, many different um, profile or answer the different profile uh, decisions, uh, configuring all the different components manually, you should be able to very easily just answer a few questions and have that application deployed for you. More than that, then we've talked about the speed of deployment and accuracy. One of the key things is getting a, a, a centralized view of an application. So a template may well configure pools for you and load balancing decisions, it may automatically configure um, a firewall or application firewall template. But if you're still looking at those objects individually and reporting on the health and utilization of those objects individually, then the template's not really doing its job properly. It's saving a bit of time up front and that's about it. So ideally, an application services template, once deployed, will not only lock it down to prevent accidental or malicious changes to the application, but will allow you to report on the entire health of an application end-to-end. -end. So that's everything from back-end server performance to network performance to clients, um, interaction with a site, and utilization, and so on. So it should become a very holistic view of that application. So dynamic application modification. Um, so Analyzing the health of an application, being able to react to it, and being able to automatically resolve issues. Um, I think Cisco coined their term of um, the self-healing network. Well, again, that, that point holds true. You know, we, we should have some way of having automatic resolution of issues within a service, uh, albeit itself. You know, it's all very well having health monitors and alerts get sent out. We all know what happens with white noise from the, you know, having hundreds or thousands of alerts being sent out for, for minor or non-existent issues. So the key here is to create some parameters up front, create some logic behind it, so that the ADC or whatever service you have in the network can modify itself without having to send out an alert. So this could be something simple such as modifying um, a, a cache, for example, if a certain number of users are reached, um, changing some routing decisions, um, or even possibly making some calls out to external systems to automatically bring up new virtual machines, bring up new IP addresses, and load balance to those automatically, all without having to have manual intervention from, from network or application operation staff. Being on the lookout for programmability tools uh, is, is key as well. Um, so making sure that scripts that you're looking to create um, have the ability to be fully logical as well. Um, there are a few, um, a few different technologies out there which allow you to customize it, have some level of automation, but without a fully logical programming language behind it, you're not going to, be able to really see the benefits. You're not going to be able to create reusable code and deploy it between different applications uh, and different ADCs. Making sure that there are external ADCs as well, uh, sorry, external APIs is pretty key. So needless to say, you would want your appliance, your service to have an inbound API so that you can centrally orchestrate it from one management platform. But does that ADC, does that service have the ability to make calls out as well? 
So it's all very well having an ADC react to a network change or a request from an operations staff member. Can it automatically make calls out? Can it integrate with other systems, as I've said, to maybe deploy new virtual machines and, and start load balancing to those? Maybe to make a call to Amazon Web Services and, and start spinning out machines there as well and start automatically sending users over to that new environment. Making sure that you've got application templates um, is pretty key, and we've mentioned internal APIs as well. Leveraging, leveraging self self sorry self solve capabilities. What does that mean? Well, there's a few things here, um, and again, from a best practice point of view, we really need to be looking at some kind of call home. Uh, system or service. Uh, this isn't going to be applicable for every environment. There's, there's many um, secure environments that I work on uh, in which you know, customers can't send uh, any information off-site to maybe the vendor for automatic um, evaluation, but where possible, it is a huge time saver, not just for logging support calls or automating the, the process of logging support calls, but actually uh, allowing yourself to go and diagnose your own problem. So there are many, many different uh, troubleshooting tools that are going to be applicable or available on the ADCs or the network services themselves. But having an external system that can automatically check your configuration against things like relevant hot fixes, looking at best practice deployment of an application, making sure that things are all set up completely accurately, checking for things like expiry of support, all this kind of stuff is hugely valuable if that can be automated to some kind of call home service. Um, having a knowledge base, so support sites, but really almost more importantly is having that community-based site or a, a developer-focused community is, is really a key as well. Again, support, support sites are essential for making sure that you, you can resolve issues that are going to be affecting you, but if you're developing, if you're just uh, trying out new things, you want to see what's possible, uh, if you're trying something a bit uh, out of the box, maybe that, uh, that hasn't been sort of fully documented, the chances are that there's someone else in the community that's tried this and possibly even written about it or, or wrote an, uh, logged an issue maybe on a developer's site. So having the support of the community there is really key as well. So another little quote, really. Um, 63% of enterprises have implemented a cloud solutions report, an improvement in agility. Um, so really, it's just trying to add some credence to, to everything that we've been talking about. So what does it mean for IT? Uh, well, best for alignment. Um, and that's not just with um, the, 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 the end users, but really it's about aligning IT with the, the application owners and business objectives. It's about having more time to innovate. So you know, we're not looking at using scripts to necessarily replace people's jobs and roles. Certainly it can save time, but it doesn't replace people's roles. What it does allow them to do is you can start, uh, start allowing IT staff to think about that on later 20 rule, you know, about allowing a lot of the repetitive um, automation to be con you know, done automatically. And that allows staff to then spend more time working on designs and architecture and the bigger picture solutions for, for the business. And reduce costs as well. You know, ultimately, if you can automate something, if you can schedule it and orchestrate it and integrate it with a bigger system, it's something that can be done potentially automatically out of hours. You know, you're not having to look at uh, paying overtime or things generally that are automated and tested and, and repeatable will be far less prone to failure as well. So for the business, all this results in basically a much, much faster time to market. So whether it's be uh, a quicker time to react to things like marketing campaigns or actually just beating competitors to the market with new services through automation, that's a very real benefit. There's much more improved uh, engagement with the, end, with the end user as well. You know, a lot of the time these scripts, this automation actually empowers users to be able to do things with their applications that they may not have been able to do otherwise. And ultimately, you're going to be getting a much bigger application return on investment as well. You're going to be getting the best out of your application through the ADCs because you can deploy services quickly and consistently no matter where they're actually deployed, whether on-prem or off-site. And that's me done. So that's a, a quite a whistle-stop tour through you know, our look at 
programmability and orchestration. Um, it's, it's obviously not been from a specific sort of FI perspective. Um, obviously, we have a, a number of different solutions that, uh, that kind of fit into the things we've talked about. But really, I wanted a chance to talk about what we see as uh, our best practice from all the time that we spend with different customers and different partners uh, across a range of technologies and platforms. So, David, back over to you. Thanks very much, David. Thank you for that. That was really, really useful. Um, guys, um, if any of you got any questions, I kind of put this up on the ch on, on the chat earlier. But if any of you have got any questions, now is the time to ask them. Um, I have got um, let's get to the question screen. All right, everybody. Excuse me. I'm trying to work the system here. Um, I have got uh, one question I've had through. So, um, David, this one's directed at you, really. Um, yeah. Uh, do you see adoption of the REST API as a trend, and what are the advantages over uh, other kinds of non-HTTP-based APIs? That's one question we've had through. Okay. Um, yeah, REST has been absolutely key. I mean, we had that quick graph earlier on that, that showed the kind of explosion, um, and there's a much more detailed uh, example of that, that that really shows the different protocols and different programming languages that are used and, and where things kick in, and REST has really been uh, huge on that. Uh, there's six, th six things that, that really stand REST out from, from a lot of the other protocols. Um, some of the key things um, about it are having a uniform interface. So it is HTTP-based. Generally, it uses XML to, to form on its data, its requests and its responses. Um, it has other things such as being cacheable, um, but really it, it's the consistency um, and, and the formality, if you like, of REST that's, that's made this hugely popular. So from an F5 point of view, you know, we've supported SOAP for a long, long time, um, but because of the huge adoption of REST, we are now, you know, we're still deploying our REST APIs, but we're moving everything quite rapidly over to a full REST API as well. Um, so we definitely see it as a future. As I said, we'll be supporting REST for a while, but um, REST is really the big thing. And then if anything, if you're going to be starting out, again, unless you have legacy systems which haven't got a REST API in space, then that's definitely what you should be looking at, given a chance. OK, fair enough. That's cool. Um, one other is around the, the, the community support to support uh, DevOps for application development. Um, somebody asking about what, what's available with regarding to that. David, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Oh, hello. Um, sorry, are you there? Sorry. I couldn't hear you for a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Back in the room. Um, so, from a generic point of view, uh, again, if you're starting out fairly new to program programming, um, there are loads of great sites you can Google. A great favorite of mine is w3schools.com. So, if you just Google for w3schools. Um, there's tons of really great stuff out there for sort of fast and learning different programming languages. Um, from an F5 point of view, um, devcentral.f5.com is really where you want to go. Um, and that's got everything from the templates we spoke about for deploying application services. There are code examples for iRules, which allows us to, to make um, changes to load balancing and data that, that passes through the F5 device. Um, but it also actually has quite a big, um, as well as support support side of it, you know, community uh, and real use of helping each other. There's also a great uh, blogging side of it. So we have a lot of, uh, of, the, of the product management, product development team that, 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 plot, that, that post about, um, you know, upcoming changes, things they're seeing in the industry. Um, so devcentral.f5.com is a, is a really great site. I think there's something like 120,000 active users on that site, so it's very, very big. Okay, fair enough. And the last question um, we've got sat on the system which you asked is, do you have integration with automation tools like Puppet? We do, yeah. So as I kind of chose about the start, that quote we used from, from Puppet around um, what they see in terms of the benefits to, to orchestration. Um, we do have really strong integration with S5. Um, I won't start throwing um, acronyms at, you know, in terms of you know, which bits of S5, but suffice to say that Puppet can be used to orchestrate an awful lot of different systems, F5 being you know, a big part of that. Um, again, Dave, I'm not sure if we can send the deck out or some links, but I'll send Yeah, we will. We'll send the deck out and uh, uh, the webinar you... as well. Great, okay. Um, 
if you know if anyone's interested, then if you just search YouTube maybe for um, F5 LTM and puppets, then there's a great video actually done by some Red Hat guys at a puppet seminar that shows a lot of the kind of benefits in real world. You know the, the benefits and some of the uh, challenges they've had, but it shows the real strength and, and the big support of the public community out there as well. Okay, that's fantastic. Right, well, I mean, that's um, pretty much all the questions we've had. So, guys, once again, thank you for uh, signing in and joining today. If any of you got any questions, then please come back to us via either Shona, whose details I think you've got, or um, via your account manager here at, at Bytes SP. David, thank you very much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And, um, yeah, everyone, no thanks for attending today. Thanks, everyone.